Great again to be here this morning together. And um, let's thank our musicians for blessing us this morning. What a joy it is to be together and sing God's praises. Amen. Heavenly Father, I pray this morning that you would give us a spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Christ Jesus. That the eyes of our understanding would be enlightened to see beyond what we see into what you see. This can only happen as you enable it to happen in our lives, Holy Spirit. We need you to help us to see beyond what we can see to what you see. In Jesus' name, we ask this for your glory. Amen. Amen. Well, you may remember last week we started a new series of messages that we're calling Overcoming Life's Giants. And all of us, I'm sure, in this room this morning, at some point in our lives, have faced issues and challenges that are bigger than our abilities to deal with. Giant-like circumstances that may have seemed to loom over our lives and tower up over us that we've had to contend with. Life for all of us has its fair few giants, has its giants for us to face. But God's Word, God's Word of promise is always there for us in such times of crisis, in such times when circumstances seem to loom large over us, it's to God's Word that we turn. It's to God's promises that we place our reliance and our trust in. And His Word and His promises enable us to face any giant-like circumstance that might come our way. In His strength, in His power, we're enabled to conquer. We're, in a, we're enabled to overcome what may seek to overcome us. And what we're going to see today is that God has made complete provision for every single one of us to overcome any and every life giant that we might face, enabling us and empowering us to be victorious. Paul said that we are more than conquerors, not through our own strength, not through our own abilities, not through our own ingenuity. We are more than conquerors through Christ who strengthens us. It's His strength, His provided strength that enables us to conquer. So, let's get straight into this this morning by reading together from Ephesians chapter 6. We'll start from verse 10 through to verse 18. Paul says this, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all to stand, stand therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and having your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all of the fiery darts of the wicked one. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, being watchful, 
To this end, with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. Hallelujah. What a descript picture God has given us through the revelation of His Spirit, through the Apostle Paul in his words in Ephesians chapter 6. And Paul here in these verses is giving us a fantastic, that's what it is, a fantastic description of what God has provided for us in Christ Jesus. Because every aspect of Paul's picture is of complete provision and protection for the most fierce battles that you and I might face. Not only do we have complete provision and protection, but we also have power in this armor. We are given incontestable power. This armor that Paul describes has incontestable power in it because, after all, it's the whole armor of God. Each and every piece is infused with God Himself. And that's how you and I are to arrive ready to face any battle. That's how we're to turn up on the battlefield of life displaying God's whole armor over our lives. Now here, Paul in Ephesians chapter 6 also introduces us to an invisible spiritual world that we, each and every one of us, is to engage with. And from Paul's words, we can conclude that every visible and physical element in our world is preceded by something invisible and spiritual. And in order to affect change in the visible physical, we have to first engage with the invisible spiritual. We looked a little at this last week, last Sunday, when we saw how in 1 Samuel chapter 17, Israel were facing Goliath, the giant, a very visible, physical reality confronted them in their lives. And what happened? Well, when you read 1 Samuel chapter 17, you see that all of Israel's armies, all of Israel's strength cowered back in fear for 40 days. Because all they saw in the visible physical realm was impossible to them for them to overcome. It was a pitiful picture of how Israel's manufactured armor was useless in the face of the Goliath. But when David turned up holding his brother's lunch, dressed like a common shepherd boy, that 40-day problem in Goliath that seemed so immovable, that seemed so impossible, was defeated by this young man that had his heart filled and fueled with faith in a living covenant with a living God that he had a relationship with. David understood that everything that is visible and physical is first preceded by things that are invisible and spiritual. And this is a principle that operates right throughout the Bible. If you look at Jesus' life, if you look at His ministry to people, before He ever dealt with any visible physical realities in people's lives, He always brought order in the invisible spiritual in relation to the Father's will and knowing it. And once He had acted there, once He had released heaven's provision there, then there was change, great change in the visible, physical realities of people's lives. This principle operates in both Old Covenant and New Covenant alike, and we could turn to hundreds, if not thousands, of testimonies where this principle is 
at work. Now, sometimes it's hard for you and I to understand this. It's hard for us to accept it because most of our lives, from the moment that we come into this world, we're immersed into a very visible, physical environment. Yet all the way through God's Word, we see that if we want to affect change or address the visible, physical realities that we face, we must first deal with the invisible spiritual source and cause of those visible physical realities that oppose God's will and work in our lives. That's what Paul's showing us in Ephesians chapter 6, that without identifying the invisible spiritual root of an issue, we just get caught up in trying to deal with the visible physical fruit of the problems that we face. No, Paul goes behind the scenes into the spiritual realm, and he says, that's where you do your war. That's where you do your battle in order to bring change to the things that are facing you in life. Think of it like this for a moment. If an apple tree repeatedly produces bad fruit, we can be critical about the apples that we're picking and tasting, but all of our critical remarks about the apples will make absolutely no difference at all. The apples will stay the same. The apples that you pick from the tree, no matter how you criticize the taste that you taste from the apple that you eat, it will not change it. At some point, you have to stop complaining about the bad apples. You have to stop criticizing the rotten fruit that you're holding in your hand. You have to dig beyond what can be seen, and only then, when you begin to dig beyond what you can see, beyond what can be seen, as you remove the soil and you find out the roots that are hidden beneath it, you find the roots that are hidden beneath it, only then can you begin to deal with the fruit that's rotten that you hold in your hand. When you reveal the hiddenness of the roots that feed the tree, when you treat the roots and look to the hidden water sources that those roots are drawing from, that give the tree life, then you begin to affect change on the fruit that you hold in your hand. Eventually, change will come. Eventually, the rotten fruit will become sweet fruit. The rotten fruit will become edible fruit. But first, you have to go beyond the visible into the invisible and check out the water sources that that tree is feeding upon. What Paul is doing here in the verses that we've read in Ephesians chapter 6 is he's going behind the scenes. He's pulling back the curtain where it all happens, where it all takes place. And he's revealing how the invisible spiritual dimension of heavenly places sets in motion the actions and reactions in the visible, physical world in which we live. And our ability or inability to address this unseen realm will determine how effective we are in overcoming the many issues of life that we face. Years ago in my, in my teens, I remember having first-hand experience of how we can affect change in the visible physical realm from first addressing invisible spiritual realities behind them. 
I was living in a small town, attending a church in Merthyr Tydville, and in the small town that I was living in, there was great concern suddenly amongst all of the church leaders that were there because an occultic shop was about to be open, and news spread fast in this small town among the churches and among its leaders, and great concern started to awaken amongst God's people. Well, the church leaders got together, and they decided to put together a petition, and hundreds of people signed this petition in protest against this shop opening. Many hundreds of signatures. They put it forward to the council. But the council looked at it and they outrightly rejected it. There's nothing wrong with having an occultic shop, selling its occultic wares and doing its demonic practices. There's, there's nothing wrong with that. If, if you've got a right to be a church, then this has got a right to be a business and offer its where. So the, the council weren't going to do anything with this, this, this protest that, that the churches were bringing. And there was great complaint. And the date was set. And I believe the local newspaper, I can remember reading about it, it hit the news, the local news anyway, in the newspaper. And it was almost as if there was this contest of power. And it was like a stalemate. Well, one night, I remember pulling up outside of this occultic shop. It was actually, and this is beautiful, it was actually the night before it was going to open. It was a Sunday night. I had to drop somebody off who lived opposite to this shop. Now, my, mile, my mind was a million miles away. I was just dropping the person off and going home. And as I stopped the car and the person, just before the person was about to get out, the Holy Spirit quickened my spirit. The Holy Spirit stirred me up on the inside. Well, I turned the car off, jumped out, jumped, jumped out, out of the car, crossed the road, and I just laid my hand quietly on the building. And under my breath, I said, I curse your evil work in Jesus' name, you will not open. Now, bear in mind, the shop's ready to go. It's ready to go. It's open, it's open day on Monday morning. Less than 24 hours away, this, this thing is going to be up and running, and it's, it's all been reported in the news and everything. What do I know? I'm just a teenager. But I was inspired by the Holy Spirit to step out of the car, cross the road, put my hand on that building, and quietly, not shout, rant, and rave, and sweat, but just quietly lay my hand on that building and say, I curse your evil work. In Jesus' name, you will not open. Well, I went home. I think that night my nan made me, you know, a bacon butty before I went to bed. Then I went to bed, laid my head on the pillow, and went to sleep. Went to work the next day, and I forgot all about it until later in the week. Later in the week, and again, it was reported in the local, the local uh, paper. Headlines. Occultic shop, for some mysterious reason, does not open. Do you know what? That shop didn't open. That shop did not open. They packed up and left town, and the business went bankrupt. It didn't even open their doors for one minute. For one minute. Do you know what, child of God? You and I have authority. We have authority in Christ Jesus because of who lives inside us, because of the power that's been given us in what God has provided for each and every one of our lives. My dad used to say to me, Dave, when you're facing demonic power or giant-like circumstances, you never have to explain your authority in Christ. You simply have to exercise it by faith from the victory Jesus has won. You know when my dad said that, my ears pricked up? 
And I've used it many times, on many occasions, hidden occasions in my life. Dave, remember, when you're faced with giant-like situations in your life that seem impossible, that seem as if they're going to overcome you, remember, Dave, you never have to explain Your authority that Jesus has won for you on the cross, in his death, in his resurrection. You never have to explain it, Dave. You just simply have to exercise it. Child of God, when you are standing against a giant-like issue that is facing you, that seems as if your back is, it seems as if your back is against the wall, and it seems as if you're going to go down, you don't have to come out with any kind of explanation as to why you're going to exercise your authority in God. Just simply exercise it in Jesus' name. Exercise it against what stands against you. Exercise it against any evil opponent that would seek to overcome you and stand like Paul says and having done all to stand, remain standing because victory is yours. Hallelujah. Victory is yours. A policeman, when making his arrest, never explains why he has to have authority to do what he's doing. If he had to do that every time before making his arrest, he'd never catch any criminal. He doesn't have to explain himself. No, his uniform is a declaration and an explanation that he's wearing authority. And that's more than enough to deal with with the criminal at hand. The moment he puts on his uniform, he is vested with the power of the law to exercise authority. You and I never have to explain our authority in God in this unseen realm. The whole armor of God. Let me say it again. The whole armor of God of God is a complete declaration, is a complete explanation to every demonic foe that you might face, that you have authority in God. You just simply have to exercise it in Him, and God will activate His power and His strength to enable you to be victorious in the battle. This power is not to be used and abused and played about with. It's not some magic wand. But it's there to, de- to deal with demonic activity and demonic power and the realms of the Spirit. My nan and Grant would always say to me, David... If you ever come up against a demonic battle in the night, remember, the blood of Jesus is more than able to bring you through. And uh, I used to look at him, what are you on about? See, my head was always in the visible physical. But they'd been to the invisible spiritual to see and to know full well that behind the visible physical, is a whole spiritual realm where we have to bring order, correction, and the will of God and the Word. I said, look at them. What do you want about, I, the blood of Jesus? I, oh, whoa. And then one night, one night, I went into that realm. And I don't want to sound spooky or mystical or anything like that. But I'm telling you now, when you've been in that realm, and I'm not talking about having a dream, I tell you, it's a, it's a real spiritual realm. When you've been in that realm, and you think, my God, you hold on to anything that you know. And now those demons came against me, man, with their voice, with their power, and my physical body was completely unable to do anything to contend with 
their mighty power. But suddenly, I tell you now, and it's the same for you, suddenly my spirit rose up in the power of the Holy Ghost to bring order, correction, and to contend with their evil wickedness. And they had to go. They had to go. And then on beyond that, numerous times, numerous occasions in that realm, your physical body cannot deal with it. Flesh and blood cannot contend with these mighty, evil, wicked powers that Paul describes in his words to the church at Ephesus. But the armor of God, the armor of God, the power that's in you, the might and the strength that God makes available to you and I is more than able to contend with those, those spiritual battles. Paul, in, in verse 10 of Ephesians 6, makes it clear to us that to operate with effect in this invisible spiritual realm, we have been given the Lord's strength, you see. That's how you're going to deal with it. You're going you're to deal with it the same way that David dealt with Goliath. The scenario's changed in that we are not holding a stone in a sling to throw it at a visible physical giant. The nature of this battle has changed in that it is invisible now. And Paul shows us that. But David understood that. Before he ever slung his stone and took out that giant, he knew that his battle was not in the visible physical In relation to facing Goliath, it was in understanding that this man had no covenant with God and therefore he was going down. The battle was the Lord's. And so it is with us. We are strengthened with God's might to operate with effect in the invisible spiritual realm. We're given the Lord's strength in power and might. Listen to verse 10. Paul says this, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. And here, Paul is pointing out that God's, God's now, God's vast reserves, all of the reserves of his might are accessible to you and I on hand to be drawn down as realized power and realized strength in our lives as we stand against spiritual darkness. I spoke to a person this week who is doing this very thing. Standing strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Currently, they're battling with their health. And they've been battling with their health, health issues, for a long time. They're facing visible, physical implications from their health that, that's causing suffering, that's causing lots of limitations. Yet even though at the moment this person is living with challenges in their health that are visible and physical, impacting every day of their lives, they're strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Because even whilst they're struggling with visible, physical realities that are bearing down on their bodies, on their body, every day this person is reciting from their heart promises from God's Word over their lives. And they will not settle for anything less than what God's promised. That's trust. That's trust. That's faith. That in the face of contrary visible physical realities, they see beyond the visible physical realities that are happening in their body and they look beyond it into this invisible spiritual and they're holding on to the word of truth of God's word for their lives. That's a person, that's a person that understands 
that to affect change into the visible physical realities that they face, you first have to deal with the invisible spiritual force that's behind the scenes. And to do that, you have to be strong. Strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. That's what they're doing. Listen, church. You've been living like that for years. That's how you live. It's how you live. Just think back. Think back over your life when you faced these problems that have towered up over you, that have seemed so unscalable, that have, that have seemed impossible. When it seemed as if you, there's nowhere to turn. When, when it seemed as if everything is closing in on you and it, and it feels like defeat is imminent. Why is it? Why is it that you have lifted your voice up to God in prayer? You've taken the word of God and you have spoken it. Yes, you may have cried it with tears. Yes, you may have spoken it from a heart filled with pain. Yes, you might have declared it amidst confusing thoughts in your mind. But you have spoken out and prayed out the word of God. Why is it that you have turned your back on the visible realities that have challenged you on, on, on the visible physical realities that have tried to overcome you and you've turned to the invisible spiritual provision in God. Why is it that you've done that? I'll tell you why it is. Because you know, you know to address any visible physical reality in your life, you have to first go beyond it into that invisible spiritual realm where God resides in order to affect change. We said it this morning, we come boldly before the throne of grace to obtain mercy in time of need. We go beyond the visible physical into God's presence before his throne to receive what we need for this life. Be encouraged. This is how we live. This is how the Holy Spirit directs us and enables us to live. In access of his mighty strength, enabling us to receive what he has for us when we are in need. Now, in verse 10, Paul continues by setting out his picture. And the imagery is of us being dressed for battle. He likens us to a soldier. And Paul had a great understanding and detailed knowledge of a Roman soldier's armor because he was chained to one for at least two years. So he uses the soldier's uniform metaphorically to help us understand. He's given us a picture of how we're to turn up in life, every day, to face any giant that might come our way. And in verse 11, Paul is direct with his direction to every believer. As he says, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Paul here is underlining points in this verse. Firstly, he's showing us that God has provided his whole armor, his complete armor, the very armor that he's infused in. This is God's provision for us. And then secondly, Paul is pointing out that what God provides we have to put on. God provides it, we put it on. Paul is issuing a command here. That's the mood, the grammatical mood in which this Greek text is written. He's issuing an imperative command. And that direct phrase, put on, 
is a command that he gives, that he issues. And there's a great sense of urgency in the mood in which Paul writes. There can be no delay. This has to be taken up, taken hold of, and put on. What's also being conveyed in Paul's words is that this is an act of your will. It's an act of our will to take up and put on this whole armor. We have to choose to do this. Paul is saying, you put on. You put it on. I can't put it on for you. Nobody else can put it on for you. You make the choice. You put it on for yourself. It's a command. Make the choice. Take the right actions that are appropriate to put on this armor, and then you will participate in all of the benefits of having it on. He couldn't be clearer. No one else is going to put it on for you. Not even God is going to do that. You have to put on what God has provided. Then Paul, in this very verse, shows us the critical purpose of God's whole armor for our lives. It enables us to stand, not to run and hide. No, there's no Christian that is called to run and hide from the battle. And I tell you now what a privilege it's been to be a pastor here in this church because what I have witnessed year after year after year is soldiers in God's army dressed for battle, none of them running and hiding and cowering back, but stuck. Standing up, excuse me, but standing up in the face of every battle, standing up, not knowing what a, the, the next day is going to bring, but not hiding on cowering back in fear, but standing up amidst all of, of, of the difficulties that face them, strengthened with God's might against every device of the devil. It's wonderful to be a part of a family of God, shoulder to shoulder with fellow soldiers, marching on to war, hallelujah, a war that's already been won that we simply, that, that we simply stand in and rejoice over as we face any demonic foe that would try to say, anything different. This armor has a purpose. It enables us, Paul says, to stand against the wiles of Satan. The word wiles means that all of these enemies in this heavenly realm have a plan. They have a purpose. They have a method or a methodology that is seeking to overcome you and I, seeking to overcome the church. But God's whole armor is more than adequate to meet all of the enemy's plans as we stand for him. Then after showing us what God has provided, after identifying the purpose for which we are to use this armor, and after saying that we're to put it on, in verse 12, Paul wants us to take note of the opponents that we face. Now, he's very, he's very exact about these opponents. He's showing us here at the heart of what he's saying in verse 12, that our opponents are not in this visible physical world. We wake up every day in a very real, visible, physical world. But our enemy, our enemy 
is not in the visible physical. Our enemy exists and operates in the in unseen, invisible, spiritual world of heavenly places. Listen to his words again in verse 12. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. That's where the war is. Our war is not with flesh and blood. It's with supernatural evil powers in an unseen realm. But what's amazing about Paul's words here is how he opens verse 12. It's quite striking. It's quite amazing. And really, it's an important point to take up and really consider. Because we can rush over and read this without really understanding the impact of what Paul is saying. He opens verse 12 by saying, we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. Think about that for a moment. We wake up every day in a very visible physical world. All of our life has been in this visible physical world. But Paul says, we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. I want to say to Paul, but Paul, when I look at your life, it's been a constant wrestle with flesh and blood. You've been stoned and beaten. You've been left for dead on the floor. You've been imprisoned. You've been run out of city after city. The flesh and blood of others have continually risen up against you, Paul. It's risen up before you to destroy you, to take you out. What do you mean, Paul? We do not wrestle with flesh and blood. People with their stones, with their rods and their chains have marked your body from head to foot, taking you to breaking point. On one occasion, Paul even said, I am despairing of life because of all of the people and the oppression and the opposition around me. It's flesh and blood that has warred against you, Paul. How can you conclude that we do not wrestle against flesh and blood? I think Paul would respond to a question like that by saying, you're right. Flesh and blood is real. We all know it is. We live in a visible, physical world. We wake up in it every single day. Now, flesh and blood is very real, and it can be very evil. But whenever someone attacks me, Paul would have us know that the visible, physical actions of others are being dictated and governed by the invisible spiritual world that's pulling their strings, that's issuing and sourcing and at the source of their actions. Paul never fought flesh and blood battles with flesh and blood. He went to his knees. He began to pray. He received his strength, not from his own abilities and from his, on, from his own actions and his own decisions. No, he went to his knees and he went into that invisible spiritual place where God has provided his whole armor, enabling him to stand amidst the visible, physical flesh and blood that was trying to constantly bring him 
down. It's a real way to live. You don't have to argue anymore. You don't have to fight visible, physical battles. That doesn't mean to say that people are, are excused to do what they want to do in relation to your life. But you know what? You and I do not have to respond to them in the, in, in the way that they are acting towards us. We can quietly, we can quietly go to our knees to where it's all happening. And when we locate the true source of what is happening in that world, we can bring order. We can give God praise. We can stand, and having done all to stand, remain standing. We're going to close in a few moments, and next week we're going to go on a little bit further into those six items that Paul describes for us in Ephesians 6. And we'll see how blessed we really are to be clad in God's very own armor. Each piece, you'll see, each piece of this armor. It's not been manufactured by any man. It's been purchased by the very own blood of Jesus himself. He paid the, the ultimate price. He paid the ultimate price to dress us well to dress us in God's finest. God wouldn't ask you to wear anything he wouldn't wear himself. And that's why he gives you his whole armor. You're dressed for battle, child of God. You're dressed, you're dressed to go on to a battlefield where you can bring about great change in the visible physical from the invisible spiritual in which you wage war. It's not complicated. It's not complicated. You just fall to your knees. You say, Lord, it's me again, standing in the need of prayer. And you pray from your heart. And I tell you now, you know, I don't have to tell you, you know the prayers that you pray the prayers of righteous men and women avail much before God. Some of us today are face to face with very visible physical realities that seem bigger than us, that loom large over our lives. You're more than able, child of God. You're going to come through. You're going to stand strong. Why? Because you're going to do what you've always done. You're going to run into the strong tower. You're going, to, you're, going to, you're going to surround yourself with God as your refuge and strength. And ever-present help in times of trouble. That's what you're going to do. You're going to do what you've always done. You're going to proclaim his word. And receive his promise as hope in your heart. To take you through irrespective of what you face, you're going to walk on through. And at the end of it, when the dust settles, you'll be standing. You'll be standing, not because of your own strength, but because this armor that you wear has been tested in every battle. It was tested on the cross. It was tested in hell. And when he ascended into heaven, Hallelujah. He sent it back down to earth for us to wear. It's tested and it will not fail. Amen. Amen. Let me pray. I'm going to ask the musicians to come. We're going to pray. And then we're going to sing. We're going to sing to God. Father, we thank you today. We stand together as your people. We thank you for the wonderful provision of this armor that you've provided for us. We put it on. We put it on. 
We thank you. That we can stand as your people facing whatever life giant we might face. Whether it's health issues, whether it's needs in our lives. Lord, we thank you as we face life's giants. We do it. Not with confidence in our own strength. We are weak. But you are strong. We do it with confidence that the armor that you've given us to stand will not fail in the day of battle. We just exercise our trust, our confidence in the authority that you've given us through the promises that we hold in our heart. And today, we thank you for your word of encouragement. Thank you for opening our eyes. Opening our eyes. Giving us a spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Christ Jesus. The giant will fall. The fear will leave. The depression will go. The oppression will lift. Freedom will come. The wrestle will end. The darkness will go. The joy, the joy will return. We just give you thanks. We give you thanks for your goodness, for your strength, for your provision, and for the enablement of your spirit. For his voice, he is the spirit of truth, and he leads us into truth so that we can walk in truth and be empowered by it. We thank you this day as soldiers of the king, as we go out of this place, Lord, our stand is for you, for your glory, and for your kingdom, and for your return. We thank you for it. Amen. We hope you enjoyed today's message. If you have any prayer requests, would like to share a testimony, or would like to give online, why not head over to our website, kings-church.org.uk. If you prayed the prayer of salvation today, and would like us to contact you to help you with your next steps, please click on the Choose Jesus button of our website. Remember you can stay connected at this time by staying in touch with your Connect and team leaders. If you are part of King's Church and are not yet connected, scroll down to our Connect Online section and we will be sure to get in touch. Thank you for tuning in. We look forward to meeting with you again very soon.